Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I must thank our founding director and also the present director of this center for having been so kind to me. Uh, I've not done that much, but I'm very glad the center is here. What I'm also happy about is that I'm giving a lecture named after Abdul Salam, whom I knew very well. I worked very closely with him. He, was, he became a very dear friend toward the end of his life. For those who may not know, uh, he suffered from Alzheimer's in the last couple of years of his life. It was very sad to see him. First, I remember the first time he found when they went there. I used to go to Trieste every few months, and I was the chairman. I, I, I was the vice president of that uh, academy at that time, and he couldn't walk suddenly. Had difficulty. He said, "You know, I'm having some difficulty walking." Then slowly he would not walk much. He would go on a wheelchair. Then suddenly he found that uh, he could not even talk too well. Uh, uh, very, he could understand, he could talk a little bit, but not too well. But he could understand everything we said. So we would talk to him and he would say yes and say a few words. And then he would whisper something in my, ma in my ear, I remember. And it was very sad to see him. And next time I went, he couldn't talk. And when I went on talking to him, he would barely whisper something and start crying. He would keep getting tears rolling down. I'll never forget that image of Abdus. He was a great scientist, a great human being, and to see him like that. A few months later, of course, he passed away. Just before he said, Rav Sahib, he used to talk to me always in Hindustani or Urdu, whatever you call it. But Rav Sahib, Ab to hamara academy ka pura academic part ab to dekhna hai. Aapko haath mein chhodke mein ja raha ho. I will never forget that. So I have been very loyal to him. So I was the president of the academy uh, for many years and took care of that. Even now I take some interest in that academy. And it has been a, it is a very nice of uh, uh, the institute, the center to ask me to give us Abdul Salam lecture. You see, it is very important what his life shows to us. It is not enough to be brilliant. The head is the one that gives you that brilliance, but you need a heart. It is the heart that actually rules the world. Unfortunately, most human beings forget. If they are smart, they think they can do anything, and they can't do anything. And those who have a heart must use the head a little bit, but heart is extremely important. Well, today's talk, in fact, I asked uh, the director one or two uh, topics again. I, I work on many things, by the way. One of the most important things I'm now doing is looking at two-dimensional materials. Why is it important? If you all remember, graphene became a big sensation a few years ago. I, we do a lot of things on graphene. More than that, why graphene? About seven years ago, I told my students, why should everyone work on graphene? We'll do that, but why not make other materials, inorganic materials, which are layered, just like graphite, Take one sheet of that and look at that. In fact, that is why we started, we were one of the earliest to start in this kind of thing. Now, of course, it, it has caught like wildfire. The hottest topic today in condensed matter science is two-dimensional materials. Uh, lots of people work on it because they uh, exhibit phenomena which we have never imagined that they would, unusual properties, unusual phenomena, and large number of applications. So unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that today. I, however, going to bring in a little bit of two-dimensional material, partly uh, through my interest in production of hydrogen. My, talking, uh, my talk today is mainly splitting water, splitting water to make hydrogen, photochemical, and also some other ways of doing it by using solar energy, or sun's energy. I hope you all know the reaction of water splitting is nothing but Oxidation of water gives you oxygen and protons, and reduction of protons gives you hydrogen. The total reaction is H2O is O2 and 2H2. The trouble with this simple reaction is that it's not allowed thermodynamically, the highly positive free energy. It's very difficult to do this work. It's very difficult to oxidize water. You get oxygen out of water, my God, it's impossible. Of course, you can, I'll tell you how to do that. But unfortunately for us, man, nature beats us all the time. Nature does it all the time, that it does in photosynthesis. So what we do, we look at today is 
water splitting, you can do by light, photocatalytic. You can also do by electrical means, electrochemical. Light and electricity, it's called a photoelectrochemical. I, I forgot to mention here, you can also do by thermal process using heat from the sun, as I will show you. One of the important things in the photocatalytic process is the photosynthesis, one of the processes we fall back on is the artificial photosynthesis. What plants do, we try to do in the laboratory in a different way. We can do this by using semiconductor structures and so on. I hope all of you know what photosynthesis is. I will take the liberty of telling you in two minutes what photosynthesis is. If not, you must all read about it. There. Something that plants every leaf continuously does it through the year, every day. I don't know why they do that, they do that. You tell me, what, what it does is, there are two photosystems in chlorophyll. In photosystem two, the light is absorbed and the electron gets excited and leaves a hole. That hole, it can't be left alone. There, what, what, they, what this, this system does is, pulls out an electron from a, what is called a water oxidation complex, and the electron goes, it is no longer away, positively charged, that hole is, dis disappears now. And now that this water oxidation complex is an inorganic unit inside the chlorophyll, that is short of an electron, that pulls out water, electron from water, water gets oxidized, oxygen comes out. That is oxygen we all breathe. Very complex process, but it does that. But you need this water oxidation complex which is an inorganic unit in the protein uh, that is in the chlorophyll. It takes a tremendous chain of events and eventually gets destroyed uh, somewhere here in the photosystem one. Again, another electron gets excited. In principle, in artificial photosynthesis, I can use two systems like this, two structures, one to do oxidation of water, another use the electron instead of food, I produce hydrogen. Of course, I don't have to do two steps, I can do this in the same step, and with only one step instead of two steps, use this electron itself for reduction and this hole for oxidation. Well, this is what we are trying to do. And uh, in simple, how is oxygen produced? One, I'll spend five minutes on oxygen uh, so that you know that I'm not only going to talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen is what I'm, my lecture is about because hydrogen is the source of energy that we all want. That is a wonderful energy, very, very high energy density and it doesn't pollute anything. It, when it burns, it gives water. There's no carbon dioxide, nothing else. So hydrogen is what we're interested in. But just because I mentioned oxygen, I want to spend what we can do to, in the lab to do oxygen. So this is what the plant is, I told you. Chlorophyll gets excited, and eventually loses an electron, becomes positively charged, and the water oxidation complex gives an electron. That, in turn, pulls out electron from water, gives out oxygen. Well, this is what... They do, but what I do now is take some kind of a dye, ruthenium co complex, that gets excited and, pick, and loses an electron, become charged, it's a divalent, it becomes trivalent ruthenium, and immediately pulls out an electron from a catalyst, and that catalyst then pulls out an electron from water, gives oxygen. Then my, how clever I am depends on what catalyst I pull. How do I pull that catalyst? Exactly what nature does, but nature has that wonderful complex which I don't have. So, it is, the, uh, for, for those who may not know, this was uh, Jim Barber in Imperial College determined the structure of this uh, chlorophyll, as you know, and uh, this is the water oxidation complex. This is the inorganic unit, which has a composition MN4CaO4. You can't balance charges in that because it's to the protein in various ways. Uh, this is the unit. So, people in Princeton saw this, I said, look here, what we need is this cubic type of a manganese oxide structure, and they started working on it. In fact, they published so many papers. What they did was they took a spinel, LiMn2O4, slowly pulled out lithium. By pulling out, you left, you are left the MnO2. That MnO2 has this kind of cube type of structure, all kinds of cubes. And they published many, many papers on that, and it gave some little oxygen uh, uh, when, they, when they used that, when they, uh, uh, from water, but we repeated that work, didn't find it to be very good actually. I don't know how they found whatever they did. The rate of oxidation coming out was very poor, so immediately we decided to start looking at this problem uh, in 2013. We had a paper on that in Proceeding of National Academy of Science. I'll show you uh, what we did. The, the reason the catalyst works is the right kind of electron. 
That electron has to be one, what we call an EG electron, one EG electron. This EG electron you can have in a particular type of cobalt, trivalent cobalt or a trivalent manganese. We did a whole bunch of those oxides with only trivalent cobalt, trivalent manganese with this one EG electron available. And that, in fact, gave a tremendous amount of result, great oxygen coming out. And uh, we showed why and how oxygen is produced. In, very soon, one of my friends, John Goodenough in Texas, also came out with a more theoretical model of that. He published a paper in Science Magazine uh, to show that. So this is how, I don't, I'm not going to talk about that, so I quickly went through, just to show that we can also produce oxygen. But uh, there are many other things one can do to produce oxygen, but nobody will use these methods to make oxygen. Uh, that, that is not the way to make oxygen, it's just that we can do what plants do in the laboratory reasonably well. Uh, our problem is hydrogen. What we'll do is take a semiconductor, excite an electron from this band here, and the electron goes out and it leaves a hole, and this hole you can't be left alone, you see, otherwise the electron and the hole will combine again, so we have to keep them separate. What we do is immediately use the hole for some oxidation process, because plants produce oxygen using that. Instead of that, I use a scavenger, get rid of the hole, and somehow we use the electron to produce, reduce the proton to hydrogen. To do this, what you require is this conduction band has to be more negative than the reduction potential of the proton. Valence bond has to be more positive than the oxidation potential of water. So, in fact, this gap must be 1.23 eV. That is why that is the redox potential of water. And in fact, there are many materials you can use that, particularly TiO2, zinc oxide, cadmium sulfide, and so on, uh, molybdenum sulfide, and many of these materials. And this, when we want, we want to do something using these materials, whether I can produce hydrogen in the laboratory using uh, uh, by splitting water, and of course using solar energy. And at that time, there were about 2010, there are many papers came from Berkeley and Caltech in America. One of the important papers was from Alibisatos in Berkeley, where he took a cadmium sulfide nanorod and attached a cadmium selenide nanorod, put a platinum particle here, and as soon as the electron got excited in cadmium sulfide, the hole went towards cadmium selenide, the electron went to platinum, where he reduced the protons to hydrogen. And that is what he did. Well, this is a very complex structure, we want to do something very simple, where even a high school student can make these nanostructures, where we took a cadmium sulfide nanoparticle along with zinc oxide nanoparticle, along with platinum, and we use this cadmium sulfide to excite the electron, and the hole we can't leave alone, otherwise they combine, and so immediately put a scavenger. I put a scavenger, which will immediately take away the hole, get oxidized, I have an inorganic scavenger or an organic scavenger, I prefer an organic scavenger because I can use an organic molecule which can oxidize to a very useful chemical like benzyl alcohol given to benzaldehyde, which is an important chemical, and get rid of the hole so this electron is available for reduction of proton. So we did that. I want to show you a result. I've not explained too many things. When we did that with the zinc oxide platinum with some modified cadmium sulfur, uh, zinc sulfide with the sodium sulfide as a scavenger, we got 12 millimoles of hydrogen, which is pretty good per hour per gram. And when I use the organic scavenger to oxidize, that, uh, to do the oxidation step, we got very, very large amount of hydrogen, 37 millimoles per hour per gram. Show you at the end of my lecture, hydrogen coming out of my reaction vessel so that you can believe what I say. Otherwise, you know, you think it's a bluffing and it's all idea and so on. No, 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 it's the real thing. I'll show you how it is cut. So this, you know, is a very high quantum yield. The height of 50% quantum yield is what we have shown. And I want to show you the kind of results we had in the literature. Uh, the activity was very, very small, five, four, five or more, 10 millimoles, until we went up to 37 millimoles. Actually, this has become now 45 millimoles. Uh, Alibisat was in Berkeley, 40, with a very complex structure. Ours is a very simple semiconductor heterostructure giving you this thing. And in fact, uh, this paper <laughs> is a very, a journal that came out some time ago, three, four years ago. Uh, by the way, this is a very difficult journal to publish in, much more difficult than any other journal. In fact, in 25, it's very... Anyway, this, we published this... Well, we have done many tricks with materials. This is the, I wanted to know that what we do in my lab, one of the areas I work in is making tricks with materials, do all kinds of new materials. 
See, zinc oxide is a white, useless material. Use it as white paint. All the cricket pay, players and all the people who uh, play in the, uh, in the beaches and so on, they put lotions, they're all full of zinc oxide. That is colorless. So it cannot be excited and visible. So I want to make zinc oxide a colored material. So one of the successes we have had in the last two month, few months is I put instead of oxygen, nitrogen fluorine, which is next to oxygen, and I can make zinc oxide of any color, yellow zinc oxide, brown, red colored zinc oxide, and which has different band gaps completely, and which is available in visible region. Now I can use zinc oxide by exciting with visible light. We have done such experiments using that such materials we get very, very good results, again, uh, uh, getting hydrogen out of these kinds of cells. Uh, oh, 35, 45, or even 50 uh, millimoles. I'll skip this one. Well, I'll skip this. this is again, too much detail. So uh, one of the problems was, of course, we use platinum in all the results. You have to eliminate platinum. We have not get of platinum also. We have eliminated. We now make cells which are very simple chemicals, cadmium sulfide, zinc oxide, nickel oxide, Nickel oxide has a conduction band, which is favorable, uh, so it can be used even though it is an insulator to form a heterostructure, which gives very, very good results. So this is the kind of work we did. Uh, I think I'll skip that. This is one way of doing it, using semiconductor structure. Well, another way, which is much, much nicer, is what I'm going to talk about. You see, some time ago, actually it was a paper in Science, which I have not quoted here, about 2010, Somebody took small particles of molybdenum sulfide, used a dye to excite the light, the electron, and used that electron to reduce protons to give hydrogen in nine small particles of molybdenum sulfide. They got some amount of hydrogen. And the same thing was done by somebody else in 2012. He took molybdenum sulfide and made a composite, combined it with a reduced graphene oxide. See, graphene, as you know, is a good conductor. He mixed it with it, and he got slightly more, just two millimoles, very small amount of hydrogen. Well, we thought we should do something nice, uh, very good in this area. So we can do very good work in this area, because we, are, we do a lot of things on molybdenum sulfide. I told you in the beginning that I, we make nano sheets, single sheets of molybdenum sulfide, just like graphene, except that molybdenum sulfide has many other properties which graphene doesn't have. So we use this kind of process where we take a dye, excite it to a triplet state, it, it uh, picks up an electron from an amine, becomes negatively charged, which is unstable. Immediately, it gives away that electron to MO. I use graphene as a uh, me medium to send the electron, and hydrogen gets, proton gets reduced in MO2. This kind of thing, and we, this technique we used in where a very uh, well known, highly cited paper, this one, in Angavanta Chemie about three years ago on this work. So, we, this is the result we got. We took MOS2, this is a literature result, very small number of moles, two millimoles was the highest ever reported. And we put some graphene, a slight better, but instead of graphene, we put it slightly nitrogen, put nitrogen inside graphene. Make it a bit more conducting, which was even slightly better. Then we wanted to make even much better. So what we did was we took graphene, which is highly nitrogenated. Nearly 15, or, we can put 15% nitrogen in graphene. No, graphene is a sheet of carbon atoms. Instead of carbon, you can put nitrogen. Uh, we are masters of that in my lab. We were the first to show you can put 15 to 20% of uh, nitrogen in graphene, and that is very good conductor, so we did that. You see, what was O5 millimoles, using that along with MOS2, we got 10, 11 millimoles of hydrogen. Unbelievable increase in hydrogen. And of course, that if I use ordinary 100 watt lamp, if we use 400 watt lamp, that went to 42. That is almost like industrial scale. You got hydrogen like crazy. Well, then I told my student, look, why are we nitrogenating graphene to make it conducting? Why don't we make MOS2 itself a conductor? We can do that. There's a chem chemical trick in MOS2. You take molybdenum sulfide, you put lithium in it, exfoliate it, and those sheets that come out, what do you mean by exfoliation? Is intercalated lithium, dump it in water. Lithium interacts with water, gives hydrogen. <laughs> hydrogen comes out, and all the single sheets of MOS2 start floating in water. That sheet of MOS2 that floats in water, when I do this, is a metallic MOS2. It is no longer the original MOS2, it is a semiconducting MOS2, with a direct band gap semiconductor. This new MOS2 is a 1T MOS2, which is metallic. So I use that. And of course, to show that we have done that, we do all the electron microscopy, by the way. In my lab, if you come, we have aberration free microscopy where I can put every atom I can see, and not only see diffraction pattern, 
but photograph every atom in this two, show that the structure is exactly one TMO is two, which is metallic. And when we did this work, the first experiment itself, we got 50 millimoles of hydrogen instead of 10. That was the, the highest record today of producing hydrogen for a single material. Uh, I, and then I will not bother you how this happens, the mechanism of how the electron goes to the d orbitals, so 2, 1, TMO, is 2, and so on. And this, is, this was the result first. 1, TMO, is 2 gives 30 to 40 millimoles. I, I showed 30, actually it was 40. Uh, you could get that many. This is how we started with, you see that line? You can't even see where, how much we were getting with the report in Science Magazine in 2010. Now we came 30 millimoles, it's very good. Anyway, you know, in everything we have done here, we do a lot of theoretical calculations. I've got a very good professor who is a very good theoretician. He immediately made some calculations. He said, you know, instead of MOS2, make it selenium, 1T MOS2, it will be even better. So we did that. And in fact, you may not believe it, instead of 50, we got 75 millimoles. So today's record of making hydrogen from a semiconductor using a dye-sensitized process, it, I put 70, you can make it 75, if you like, with very high turnover factor. See, this is... If nothing, we have 05, we started with, you remember? So, this, in other words, in our lab now, we can produce hydrogen. It's all based on sunlight. Huh? The only energy I use is sunlight. No other energy. No electricity, nothing, nothing. Just sunlight. So, this is a very, very good uh, process, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, uh, this, this kind of a work is a kind of thing one should be doing to actually to even improve uh, hydrogen production. Well, uh, uh, suddenly it occurred to me, why only sun has heat also, right? Sun gives a lot of heat. I hope you all know, I, I, I hope you all know what, uh, what is the light sun gives. Sun gives mainly visible light. 40% or more of the light we get from the sun is visible. Only 5% is ultraviolet. So uh, anyone with an ultraviolet light, I don't look at that work because ultraviolet is not useful. Ultraviolet light is very little from the sun. We want visible light. Everything I've done is using visible light of the sun. So, sun gives heat. Can I use the heat from the sun? I, then we do elementary chemistry to do that. I want to show such elementary chemistry, every high school student will know that. I take an oxide, I heat it at some temperature. It loses oxygen. That is the endothermal sub. It absorbs heat. Then at that time, I pass CO2. And then what it does is this oxide, which is now deficient of oxygen, it has lost oxygen, pulls out an oxygen from CO2, gives you carbon monoxide, and goes back to the original oxide. Or instead of put that, you put water, steam, it pulls out oxygen from steam, gives you hydrogen, and goes back to the original oxide. Very simple process, except that there are high temperature. But this process can give both carbon monoxide and hydrogen a high temperature process using solar energy. Well, you know, what is so great about that? What we require today in the world is reduction of carbon dioxide to get, getting rid of carbon dioxide. One of the things is, of course, we can make alcohol, methyl alcohol. That is, another is the carbon monoxide, which is poisonous, but carbon monoxide and hydrogen is like godsend material because that is what I need to make all the hydrocarbons, all the pharmaceuticals, that is the syn gas, synthetic gas. So in one way, when one method I have, I can make both carbon monoxide and hydrogen by a simple thermal process. So in fact, this is long ago again, this was another paper in science. Somebody had tried this idea long ago in 2010, and uh, he used cerium oxide, heated it, lost some oxygen, passed some water or CO2, got either hydrogen or carbon monoxide. He showed it occurs, except that CO2 is a law. He doesn't know, didn't know obviously solid state chemistry that I know. You see, the wrong oxide to pick. So cerium oxide, oh, we can make cells like this. So these cells, may, both in Israel and in Switzerland, you can make solar cells, which operate at 1800 degrees or 1200 degrees, oxygen loss using this cell, and then you pass carbon dioxide or water and get the hydrogen or carbon monoxide in these in this cells. It's a very, very simple solar reaction cells one can make to get the heat from the sun. Well. I immediately knew, because I'm a solid state chemist, I do all kinds of oxides. This is not cerium oxide, it's the wrong one. You must use an oxide of manganese. Manganese four loses an oxygen, becomes, I'm sorry, manganese three loses, uh, uh, manganese four loses oxygen, gives manganese three, 
and then it goes back to manganese 4 uh, after reaction with water or CO2 giving H2 and CO. MN3 goes back, this cycle. So when we did that, this, I hope you can see this, this simple uh, the figure, does it, not as complex as it really looks. Take CO2 that has been done in the literature, it loses oxygen when you heat it, very small amount of oxygen, then I pass water or CO, it goes back to the original oxygen. This is the weight, the weight loss. So loss loses oxygen, again picks up oxygen, gives out hydrogen or CO. I took, instead of that, my manganese oxide, instead of CO2, look at this manganese oxide, lantern, much more oxygen is given out, then I pass CO2 or H2O, it goes back to the original. So the amount of oxygen released or carbon monoxide produced is enormous with manganese oxides. So this is the process, solar thermal process. Same is true with hydrogen. I could get hydrogen by passing so steam over it. And so immediately we can use, this where chemists are different solid state chemists. Instead of using lanthanum, I can use a whole bunch of rare earths where I vary the rare size by varying the size, uh, decreasing the size and vary the, what is known as the tolerance factor of these perovskite structures. And when I do that, a new perovskite using yttrium instead of lanthanum, you see you lose much, much more oxygen. It started with you so much oxygen was released by heating. Now these are 198 uh, micromole per gram. We get 480 micromole per gram. So I can use this now for doing the same reaction. And of course, I don't worry about that. Uh, we have done that. And you can see by yttrium, astonishing manganese oxide, you get an enormous amount of oxygen. And if in this case, I get carbon monoxide from carbon dioxide. The same is true of hydrogen. You get a lot of hydrogen. So we have now reduced the temperature to as low as 900 degrees. Today in the laboratory now, at 1,000 degrees, you can decompose water or CO2 by getting, or getting CO. Or this is a record temperature, lowest temperature known for decomposition of water today by this kind of a process. Well, I will not bother you with tables. Uh, we can do this second step, 900,000, 1100 degrees. We can do decomposition of water or decomposition of CO2 as well. I will not, this again showing the rate at which I produce hydrogen. Well, uh, I would like to show you one more. Uh, this temperature is too much for a thermal process. So there's a friend of mine in Caltech, Dave, Mark Davis, he produced, a, he produced a new cycle, a thermochemical cycle for splitting water at low temperatures. And I'll show you this. It is a very simple cycle, actually, but it looks complex. What you do is start with MN3O4, manganese oxide, heat it with sodium carbonate, you get sodium manganate and so on, and carbon dioxide. This, you react further with gone while heating it, you get hydrogen eventually and carbon dioxide, you pick up that hydrogen. And then it goes back eventually, goes back in this cycle, producing NHX MnO2 and again MnO3O4. You go through this cycle and go back. This cycle can be done at 850 degrees, he showed, which is very lowest temperature man has known for decomposition of water. Water can be decomposed at 800 degrees or 850 degrees, that's what he showed. And uh, we have shown in Bangalore now, uh, it is uh, just come out our work, uh, and do the same at 600 to 700 degrees, 750, 700 in my lab, you can produce uh, hydrogen. The thermal decomposition at 700 degrees unknown for water. It was always 1,500 to 2,000 degrees. Now that has now brought down in this multi-step thermochemical cycle to 700 degrees. So uh, many people have written, you can make it into a commercial plant if you like, I'm not going to do that, I'm too old for some young guys somewhere. A lot of people are writing, you know, you can do this process to produce hydrogen. Or the earlier process, solar thermal, produced both carbon monoxide and hydrogen. There are many newspapers all over the world wrote about that, that we have got in Bangalore a simple thermochemical process using sun heat from the sun to produce both carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which is good for industry. Well, whether they will do it or not, I don't know. For industry, somebody if it does it very good, but it is possible is what I've shown. What is particularly nice about this one is, at least it is satisfying to me that we can reduce, rather uh, decompose water into hydrogen at as low a temperature as 700 or 750 degrees. I just am telling you what one does. You see, this is one of the areas of my research. It's not my main area, by the way. I just, I just took it as a challenge because young people don't do difficult research in India. They all do easy things. So I thought I must do that. This should be done by young fellows, not me. Uh, but anyway, then you see what happened was, I talked to the, I, I don't know if you know this, 
the, the greatest experts in sun's energy, solar heat and so on, are Israelis. I don't know whether you have gone to Weizmann Institute in Israel. It's unbelievable. You know, they got heaters working at 3,000 degrees, 3,500 degrees using sun's heat by using condensers. It's very, very well known, Israel's uh, ability. So I wrote to one of my friends. He came to Bangalore. And he looked up all this, he said, very easy, 800,000, it is a child's play. I, don't know, I showed you the design of the cell, which you can use for using solar heat to produce hydrogen carbon dioxide. So we talked about that. Then he asked a very silly question, simple question, but it got me thinking. So I won't talk about that for a minute. He said, Professor, now why are we worrying about all this? After all, sun's energy is being produced as electricity by photovoltaics. So use the electricity from photovoltaics to electrolysis of water. Hydrogen, you'll get. But uh, then I thought, my God, that's a good idea, except that you can't electrolyze water. I hope you know that. Electrolysis is already to demonstrate in the classroom. You can't go on producing hydrogen because of the problem of over potential. So you have to use big catalysts. And if those, those who read nature regularly, last two years, there been several papers in nature where they are trying to get rid of platinum to get rid of the over potential problem for electrolysis. But every paper is trying to get rid of nitrogen, uh, platinum. So I thought I should look into this. So I've got a material. Uh, I, I'm going to use a material called BCN, borocarbonitrate. I do a lot of this is a creation. This, most of this material was a creation in Bangalore, in Nehru Center. What is this material? BCN has BN and C. C is graphene, highly conducting. BN is boronitrate with highly insulating. Again, where is the composition in such a way? I can tune the band gap in this material depending on the composition and the way I make it. So I can do any kind of borocarbonate I want with all kinds of properties, by variation that, by varying the composition. So I, I thought I would use that for this material to get rid of the, instead of platinum. For those, there's a volcano plot like this, which is the best material for electrolysis of water. This was from Nature Communicant 2014. See, everyone does platinum, sometimes iridium, rhodium. The, and then one of the papers in Nature last year or rather this year, is this one, the red thing, nowhere near platinum. And another material, this one, nowhere near platinum. So I we thought we should uh, do something using some material like borocarbon nitride, which is a combination of insulating boron nitride and a conducting graphene. So I just want to describe everything. Uh, it has just come out, this work, in energy and environmental science. And you see, we varied all kinds of composition. I show one composition. This composition, this is platinum. This composition, look at the onset potential. Same as platinum, almost the same. And it's very stable, and very little charge transfer resistance. And uh, look at the values. Look at the onset potential of my compound. This, I can vary this also further. Is 284 millivolts. Platinum is 230 millivolts, pretty close. I can even do better. And then, uh, over potential, this is 298, this is 250. Pretty close. I can do better. Of course, Faraday efficiency of this method is, of my material is 100%. Well, I'll not bother you more, except that I, right away we had to show why is it that my materials are so good? Of course, it was me, one, one did the density functional and other calculations. Showed that the two materials, are, one or two compositions I made, have the valence band and the conduction band at the right time, the conduction band minimum and the valence band maximum. You see this dotted line, the conduction band should be above that, valence band should be below that. You see these two compositions, this particularly is a very good composition to work on. In fact, the two compositions we propose as a replacement for platinum belong to that category. Others are, these are no good because they cross this line. And so this is the kind of work I think uh, we have done just recently. What we have done, tried to show in when I have one lecture without going into detail, photochemically using artificial photosynthesis, I can use semiconductor structures to produce hydrogen. Because you also produce oxygen, but that's not the challenge. It is just to show we can do that. Uh, we can also use the disensitized method of semiconductors, MOS2, to produce hydrogen. Then you don't have to use solar energy for light at all. You can use heat and also produce hydrogen. So hydrogen can be produced both photochemically and thermochemically. And then, you know, what about the electrochemically, which is normal uh, way of doing it, well, you can do that, provided you find this replacement of platinum. It is possible, probably, with materials of this kind that I gave you.
Guru Nekke. This is the first experiment we did. You see, what I've got is a, some semiconductor structure there, and I'm shining light. It goes on hydrogen, keeps on coming like that. I hope, can you see it? Yes or no? Well, okay, this is... Ah, that is better. It's just a 100 watt lamp, just in the lab. But you don't have to do 100 watt. If you come to my one of my students, uh, in the, right now in my lab, upstairs on the roof, he has set up five reactors, not for this, for something else. I'll talk to you in two minutes. Uh, uh, to do continuously for days or end, it goes on. It just sense energy. And this is a lot of hydrogen coming out. So in other words, it's no longer one is no longer bluffing. It actually can produce enough hydrogen and in fairly easily using solar energy, either in terms of heat or the... Well, the question is, Man, what are the two burning problems? There's a lot of young people, I'm telling you. If you have to pick two problems that humans are suffering from, one is insufficient energy, that is why hydrogen. Another is terrible pollution. I hope you all know that. I don't know how I live in Bangalore anymore because this carbon dioxide of Bangalore and Delhi, both are terrible. Delhi is polluted, Bangalore is equally polluted. Everything that you don't need is there in the air. I mean, everything you don't want. So what you need is not there. Oxygen issue is short uh, in, in Bangalore. But what has happened is, this carbon dioxide is so great that it's polluted all the rivers, particularly the oceans. Ocean actually is already forming carbonate rock. The pH of the ocean is changed in many places. It is not an exaggeration. I've got great friends of mine who do all these measurements. It is really pathetic that we have allowed oceans of the world to be destroyed. CO2 is forming eventually in about five times 3,000 years or so, I come, if I am born again, I will find everywhere carbonate rocks. Because so much carbonate, carbon dioxide. So either we have to find something to do with carbon dioxide. So today in my, though I talked about hydrogen, I tried to show what one can do with carbon dioxide. When using reduction to carbon monoxide, so that you can use that to make hydrocarbons or whatever you want. That is one way. Well, there must be other ways. So one of the challenging problems now, Everybody worth his salt in chemistry or chemical physics uh, is looking at reduction of carbon dioxide. In fact, uh, it's a very, very important problem. You go to Caltech, Berkeley, Harvard, anyway, everybody, nobody will be doing that, trying to do that. Well, right now in my lab, I had, uh, we have very great, remember I told you the semiconductor structure giving hydrogen. We, are dis they, they, we have figured out a, the right kind of a new, another kind of a semiconductor structure, which when you pass CO2, gives me methane, CH4, hydrocarbon, and maybe CO, and hopefully eventually methyl alcohol. So we are trying to do that work. This is the one that my student has on the roof. He wants to do that with sunlight, not in the lamp, 100 watt lamp or 400 watt lamp in the lab. I told him once in a night he has to do in the lab. He's just having these reactors on the roof of Nehru Center. Unbelievable the way the carbon dioxide is able to be converted into something, reduced species, is very nice. So this is the kind I just, you know, this is not a research seminar. This is a seminar where I'm trying to tell you, tell you the kind of work one, one, one must be doing or one should do and which is very important. I've tried my best uh, to do some, some of this kind. There are many other things one can do and one has to do. But uh, this is very important that we solve this problem of hydrogen. Now, the only problem we have not solved is, suppose we make all the hydrogen. Suppose that I succeeded. The problem we have solved is how to store hydrogen. That is a challenging problem. If somebody has, give me a good problem. I would solve the problem of storage of hydrogen. Not putting in a cylinder. That I can put it. You, I don't need you. Cylinder hydrogen is not available. In fact, you know, I've gone many places. Whenever I go in every country, they think I'm a hydrogen man. I use nanotechnology. So the professor, you must come and see our car. Everywhere I had to make me sit in the wretched car. And the Toyota did that. That Mercedes Benz or whatever, that um, German company. Every time I was used to worry because they had hydrogen cars. The damn cylinder was under my seat. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't want hydrogen cylinders in planes. Would you like to go in an aeroplane, which is hydrogen cylinder running the aeroplane? No, no, no. So no plane will agree to use a hydrogen cylinder. But cars they are doing. Already Delhi is having a hydrogen cylinder car. You can fill the hydrogen in some Delhi stations. Uh, I don't go to buy that car. I am a bit worried about that. But anyway, the question is how to store. So the one lot of research is going on and putting, keeping hydrogen in matrices of solids where they are stored very nicely 
A very little hydrogen, by little scratching, by little heating, hydrogen comes out. Hydrogen must not be absorbed very, uh, 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 must not bind very strongly, neither should be physically absorbed so that it comes out very easily. Some weak interaction, weak binding, maybe about 10, 15 kilocalories or 60 kilojoules type of bonding bond. So that is what we need. We don't have it. We need about, according to the Department of Energy in the United States, 6 weight percent of hydrogen for, to be stored. Uh, in fact, graphene I have showed some time ago can store 5 weight percent in my lab. We have showed. But it needs 6 weight percent of graphene is good, but not as good as it should be. So there must be some other material, another very important problem. So what I have tried to show you is the problem related to energy and carbon dioxide, I think are very interesting and important problems where a lot of challenges are there. Thank you very much. Okay. Will you take some questions? Uh, if they want, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rao, for that very fascinating and inspiring uh, talk. Uh, perhaps a couple of questions uh, from... Couple is enough. <laughs> Only double. Okay. Younger people. Hmm? Even older people. <laughs> Well, I had a, a small question, yeah. which is, uh, what are the pros and, I mean, you mentioned the photochemical and then the thermo, the state, what are the pros and cons if you had to do it in a large well, photochemical scale? Photochemical is the best because it's sunlight, no, uh, in the, in the heat is much more difficult to maintain, the cells are more difficult to operate, but you can do it. But the photochemical is the best. The photosynthesis is plants are doing sure. all the time. Right? So, but then do. why why is the thermochemical being explored? Well, because, a, you know, but you can do that also. Because the quantities you produce by thermochemical is much, much more, very fast. Okay. The efficiency is much, much higher in thermochemical system. Photochemical, the quantum efficiencies are good, but not good enough to get large quantities. Okay. But together, you know, the, that system is also good for carbon dioxide reduction. So I can do both carbon dioxide and uh, water mm. reduction to get hydrogen so and CO. So you solve so two problems in a sense. Two problems yeah. at the same time. No, no question. Any questions? Somebody is there. Yeah, Mike. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, this is not relevant to today's uh, talk, actually. Uh, then why are you asking? I have, yes, sir. I will ask on a general question. Yeah. Uh, could you tell me in uh, China, they are capable of producing LED at the cost of just one rupee? You change the subject, LED. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is okay, sir. Just I want. Uh, China, they are producing everything very cheap. Everything very cheap. And we are buying it. Correct. Do you see all the Christmas decoration in India is from China? Yeah. Amazing. Correct, sir. Our Christmas, Chinese decoration. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> but, you know, for those, for, for those who may not know, the Chinese manufacturing uh, technology, even in terms of producing graduate students and PhDs, the manufacturing technology is good. Yeah. For example, they are producing 23,000 PhDs per year. Yeah. And when I went to China, you know, I got some award from Chinese Academy, and they said, we are going to produce 30,000 PhDs per year. Yeah. You know, I told him, what do you do? We have every, these young girls and boys who come to chaperon me, take me around. They all have PhDs with five years postdoctoral experience. So why are you doing this dirty work, taking me around? Why don't you work in a lab? So this is the only job I can get. So very soon, every sweeper will have a PhD in China. So, so their way of doing is different. You see, what they have done is, silicon, they, you know, you remember India was the, one of the first countries to get into silicon technology. We even set up a company in Hyderabad, yeah, rather, uh, Delhi. They used to make sales. Bangalore also was making BHL, small silicon cells. We stopped all that. Today, the entire world buys silicon cells from China. That is, that is why you see the electricity from photovoltaics today is the same cost as electricity from the grid, mainly because of the Chinese silicon cells. So why is it we didn't do it? It's the same thing. You know, the LED, we should be doing it. That is based on gallium nitrate technology. That is not difficult. We should be doing it. I don't know why we have not done it. A uh, lot of companies are doing Japanese are doing a lot of LED technology also. China is also doing. Uh, uh, there, there, there is not, but the cheap cost. See, the Chinese uh, methodology of paying and workers, everything is different. Uh, their, their style, is their way of doing is different. So I can't tell where they save the cost. Uh, for various reasons, they save the cost, I think. But uh, quantity-wise, they do very large quantities of everything. For example, even number of students, you know, if you go to the Department of Physics or Chemistry, I went to some department to give a lecture, 
They said, how many students are there in your physics department? I think we have 675. You mean 675 PhD students? Yeah, yeah, 675 PhD students. So every department I want has minimum 500 to 700 PhD students in, in one department, physics, chemistry, biology. We can't deal with such numbers. Everything is large, squad. Uh, the same as far as research is concerned, they're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and effort on reducing costs, manufacturing. Uh, we are not doing enough of that manufacturing research. Thanks for providing opportunity to ask question. So this is Basharat Ahmed here. Huh? Uh, Basharat Ahmed uh, from Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Bangalore. Uh, we are very near to Professor Abdus Salam and uh, we have heard a lot of things about... Ahmadiyya? Yes, pretty much. Very good. <laughs> so the question was like, he has put forward a lot of theories uh, related to black, black holes and things. So we want to know how these theories are going to be taken forward. No, and no, no. How are he was, he may did some very fundamental work related to unification of forces, you know, from Einstein's time on, a lot of things that we have known, many things he did are very fundamental to this entire field. And that is the field that people like him and Pinta Wadia, many others work on. Oh, he made it very, very important contribution to this area. No question about that. Yeah, it is now one of the... One of the founding, founding. foundations of this area. Yeah. So that work will last forever. Forever. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Yeah, quickly, quickly. Sure. Yeah, Hello, I respect it, sir. I have a question. Uh, from my study days, I had this uh, uh, doubt. Is it possible to create uh, artificial photosynthesis to minimize the uh, carbon dioxide amount in uh, nature, sir? No, artificial photosynthesis, you see, there, you know, you have to, uh, what plants do is make food out of CO2. Where nobody has made food artificially yet. Uh, we have made hydrogen. Okay, the sir. process is also reduction, okay. hydrogen. Uh, food, no, but I don't think CO2 reduction by artificial photosynthesis is very difficult. However, we do photochemically, not artificial photosynthesis, we can reduce CO2 to do whatever we want, like alcohol, other things we can do. Not making food, but something else. Useful it's, product? We, well, we okay. reduce it. That's what I said in my lab now. One of the very successful experiments we have had is in the last few months is reduction of CO2 photochemically using sunlight to produce lower, lower reduced products. But it won't be food, it will be something else. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor okay. Rao, for uh, giving us this glimpse into okay. the photosynthesis.